Okay, good afternoon or good morning and happy Earth Day to everyone who has joined us here on time. Uh, I'm looking at the queue to get in for the webinar and there's still several people logging on. So just to uh, allow them to be for the start of the presentation, we'll just give another minute or two for them to, to get settled in there. So thanks for your patience and we'll just start the, the program here just in a minute. And for those that are just joined us now, just wanted to let everyone know we're going to allow for some additional people to sign on in before we start that webinar. So just bear with us. Thanks again for your patience. Okay, thanks again for everyone's patience. We're going to get started for today's webinar presentation. My name is TJ Willits from Veolia Water Technologies, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Uh, and th this uh, event is entitled Anaerobic Best Practices for Brewery Wastewater. Some housekeeping items to get through before we begin the core of today's presentation. Obviously, you should be hearing me speak. There are two ways to connect to the presentation's audio. You could either use your computer, speakers, or headphones, or the other option would be you could use your phone uh, and call in as a conference call. So if you're having issues with your audio, uh, one or the other, you should go ahead and, um, and be able to, to log on and try the other one. If you're still having any issues, just uh, hop out of the webinar and start back in, and that normally will fix any other problem. Uh, lastly, um, your microphone is currently muted since there's so many people currently attending the webinar, um, but uh, no worries. We've arranged for a way for you to interact with today's panelists. Um, the first way you could do that is just uh, log on and chat throughout the webinar. There's a question panel on the right-hand side. Uh, if you have a question that you, you have, don't even um, worry about waiting to the end. You can go ahead and enter the question and we'll try to get those in queue and get through as many of them as possible after the main part of today's presentation. Um, so today, uh, this webinar is part of an actual campaign of three weeks of interactive webinars. We're on the tail end of, uh, of this webinar series. Um, you can see some of those listed there, the topics there that started in early April. Uh, but though we're on the tail end, no worries. Um, all of the things that we've presented so far, they're all available on our website, on demand 24-7. So if you want to either register for one of these current webinars, uh, or if you wanted to watch several of our webinars on demand, you could just go to www.violiawatertech.com and uh, on our homepage, you'll be able to find where those webinars are at. Participation certificates, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna send out a PDF participation certificate about 24 hours after the webinar is finished. You can see what it looks like there, uh, but it'll come automatically from the GoToWebinar software. So uh, be on the look at that for tomorrow and you could go ahead and, and download that PDF cert. Something we're doing fun, we love feedback on these webinars to help us. It helps us prepare for our future webinars, make sure the topics fit what the audience uh, wishes to hear. So what we're doing is we're offering a $25 Amazon gift card to uh, a random uh, person who completes the survey. It'll be presented right after the webinar to take that survey or in your follow-up email. It takes about 30 seconds to complete, but we really enjoy that feedback to continue to improve these, these presentations. So we look forward to hearing uh, back from you on that survey. And before we begin the, the presentation, if you're not familiar with Veolia Water Technologies, a little bit about who we are is that we are a leading water and wastewater treatment provider, and we operate within three key main pillars. It's technologies, projects, and services. And using those three key pillars, we look to help our municipal and industrial customers uh, 
complete any challenge that they might have related to, to water and wastewater. Great, well, here we are. We're gonna start our core presentation. We are very fortunate to have our very own in-house expert, Jill Jordan, a senior process specialist. A little bit about Jill is that she has more than 35 years of experience in anaerobic treatment, and she's done everything from commission the very first uh, high-rate anaerobic biothane system uh, in the United States as well. Uh, she's managed our lab in, in past, and she's currently uh, working on developing and, and commissioning several uh, projects around uh, US and Canada as we speak. Something new uh, for our presentation, we went and uh, requested one of our clients out there. His name is Michael Mistishin. He is with Yingling, uh, and he's been so uh, generous to share his time a little bit uh, to contribute to this presentation as well. Uh, a little bit about Mike is that he received his BS uh, from uh, in environmental engineering from Penn State, and he's employed obviously with DG Yingling and Sun Inc. at the Pennsylvania Brewery since 2014. He's been certified with the state of Pennsylvania as a wastewater operator. And at Yingling, he's responsible for developing and implementing an environmental management system, which brought the company into compliance with local, state, and federal regulations. His work includes environmental compliance reporting, managing the day-to-day -day operation of the Pottsville and Mill Creek Brewery's wastewater pretreatment facilities. And if that's not enough uh, work for him to do, he also uh, is an instructor at the University of Sciences in Philadelphia, where he lectures on incoming water and wastewater, and as well has been a guest lecturer at Penn State University's School of Engineering on Residual Waste Management and Industrial Wastewater Treatment. So we look forward to hearing a little bit more from him later in the presentation. So at this time, I want to hand the reins of this uh, of this webinar over to our very own Jill Jordan. Jill, are you with us today? Yep, I'm here. Great, thank you. Okay, happy Earth Day again, everybody. Um, I also wanted to add that, um, just so you know, my, my experience in breweries, I've started up every brewery project we've had in the United States and Canada, and a couple of them in Mexico too. So um, I, like, I like breweries. Um, on today, I will first want to go over what the, the program agendas is, and we're going to first discuss why are we discussing brewery wastewater, and who cares? Um, we're going to talk about the brewery wastewater characteristics, go over briefly some common high-rate anaerobic treatment design options, and then we're going to turn it over to uh, Michael so he can discuss the uh, Yingling Brewery and its operation and, and spotlight that. So why should we even bother discussing uh, breweries and brewery wastewater? Well, breweries, first of all, produce a lot of wastewater. They, re they produce two to five barrels of wastewater per barrel of beer produced. Um, that's a lot. Um, I've even actually seen up to seven barrels per barrel of beer. So it's a lot, it can be a lot of wastewater. And brewery wastewater has characteristics that are similar to other food and beverage type producer wastewater. Also, there's a lot of breweries in the world, and most of them have to pre-treat their wastewater before they can be discharged to a municipal um, uh, system. Um, in fact, 23% of the biothane plants worldwide treat brewery wastewater, so that's a lot. Um, even in, you know, that's like over 100 breweries we have uh, wastewater pre-treatment plants at. Um, we consider high-rate anaerobic wastewater treatment a good option for pretreatment, obviously. And finally, we all love to drink beer, so it's a good topic because we want to do it responsibly, especially on this Earth Day. So where does brewery wastewater come from? Most of the brewery wastewater originates from cleaning processes. That's cleaning, CIPing lines, CIPing tanks, cleaning out tanks, whatever. Um, it can also come from bottling. Uh, fillers overflow, line lubricants can also contribute to flow and load going to wastewater treatment plants. Pasteurizers also contribute some water and some load um, and disposal returns. Um, hard to believe, but not all the beer that's produced and goes out to, um, to customers is consumed. 
And if it's over date, it comes back to the brewery and it has to be disposed of in some way. And a lot of times that's down the drain. Um, you can also have spills or operational mistakes that require that the uh, product be dumped. Um, spills happen all the time, a line breaks, a valve gets stuck open or a valve is unintentionally left open by a mistake. And that type of product, then product can go down the drain. And of course that all leads to load to a wastewater treatment system. So what are some basic wastewater characteristics? I first want to explain where I got these numbers for the influent wastewater that would be coming to a, a pretreatment plant. We have a number of uh, customers that routinely send us their operating data. And I've taken, there's like five or six of breweries that send it to me regularly. And some of them have been in operation for 20 years, some of them only for a couple of years. I took those, uh, uh, those, those breweries operating data and did a yearly average for the past three years on those um, breweries. And then I made an average of the averages. And that's what the average number here is. The max and the min are also the max and the min of those yearly averages. So the important thing here I wanna discuss first is the pH. Um, typically brewery wastewater has a high pH. You can see the average from the plants that I took samples from, uh, sample data from was about eight. It can range from six to 12. It's not unusual to see it coming down at 10 all the time. The temperature ranges from anywhere from 70, about 70 to the mid 90s with the average being 82. The total COD ranges about 2,500 up to almost 15,000. And the average is about 6,500, 65, 6,600 total COD. The suspended solids are also a, a, an important uh, number to look at because high rate anaerobic wastewater treatment systems are designed to treat soluble COD and not necessarily solids. But the solids here in brewery wastewater tend to be pretty high. Um, the average is almost a thousand parts per million and the maximum is almost 3000 with the uh, low in the 200s. Um, another important thing, uh, parameter in the influent wastewater are the nutrient values and that's nitrogen and phosphorus. The total Kelvin nitrogen is typically enough to provide um, nitrogen for the bacteria in the pretreatment process, and so is the orthophosphate. Now, looking at what comes out of our high rate anaerobic systems is shown in the effluent side. And I want to make clear that this is a mixture of effluent from UASB reactors and EGSB reactors. So high rate and ultra high rate systems. As you can see, the effluent volatile fatty acids, which is a key parameter in determining system performance, is very low. It's average is only 1.63. We consider anything under five uh, good. So, and I have to say in most of the breweries, it's closer to zero than the 1.63. The maximum of 11 was from a brewery. I kept it, I kept it in there, even though they had a bad upset in that year. And so that um, skewed that uh, maximum value for the VFAs. Notice that the temperatures here range from 73 to 98 with an average of 90. We consider um, good operating reactors should be run around 95 to 100. The 73 and the minimum comes from reactors and customers that don't have any temperature control on their um, wastewater treatment system. So they're operating at ambient temperatures or so whatever temperature comes down. And in the winter at some of these plants, it can get very, very cold. The soluble COD in the effluent ranges from less than 100 to about 500 as on the average, with a maximum of that uh, 2,400. The suspended solids, look at the average there on the average uh, effluent TSS is only 760 milligrams per liter. And the average on the influent is almost 1,000. So on average, we do see some reduction in TSS across our systems, although in reality, we don't expect the effluent suspended solids to be greater than the influent suspended solids. Um, also notice that the TKN on the influent and effluent are approximately the same as is the ortho P, and that's enough to provide nutrients for the system. 
So let's look at some of the performance um, parameters for our wastewater treatment plants. Again, these are from UASB and EGSB systems. And I want to point out here that the biomass that's grown in these reactors is very high quality. The uh, volatile content averages almost 90%. So that means of all of the solids that are in the reactor, 90% of it is volatile, which could, which means that a, bindy, a high percentage of it is the biomass itself and not inert material. The biogas quality off of these systems is also generally pretty high with an average of 80% methane. The hydrogen sulfide is also an important parameter to look at because if you want to use the gas, um, typically uh, biogas uh, usage equipment such as boilers and CHP units have a limit on how much hydrogen sulfide can be in the biogas. And that really range, ranges from like 700 up to 3,000 parts per million untreated biogas. Now, there's nothing you can do well, I shouldn't say that. There's very little you can do about controlling how much, how much hydrogen sulfide is generated in your anaerobic reactor because the source of the hydrogen sulfide is typically mostly due to the source of the water that you're using to brew beer. So if you have very little sulfur in the water that you're using to brew beer, you're gonna have very little hydrogen sulfide in your biogas. If you have higher concentrations of sulfur in the water you're using to brew beer, you're going to have higher concentrations of hydrogen sulfide. The higher concentrations of hydrogen sulfide usually just mean that you have to add something on the back end to treat the hydrogen sulfide in the gas before it's burned. Let's look at how much COD is reduced. Let's look at the soluble COD reduction and the BOD reduction because that's the most relevant here. The soluble COD and BOD reductions average in the low 90%. That's really, really good. Um, the total COD reductions, if you look at the line above, vary from like 65 up to 92% with an average of about 80%. And that varies because of the amount of solids that are in the effluent. The more solids in the effluent, the higher the COD in the effluent, the total COD is in the effluent, which means that your total COD reduction isn't as high as the soluble COD reduction. Um, the volumetric loading rates vary all over because again, these are um, data from both UASB and EGSB reactors. And you can see the low is like three. The average is almost, well, seven and a half and the maximum is 18.75 um, kilograms of COD per cubic meter of digester volume per day. Um, I also have to say that all of these breweries that we're talking about here that went into this um, data, are all treating all the brewery wastewater. And some of them, uh, the brewery production over the years has decreased um, and therefore they're not running at their design limit. That's the case for like the, the, the one brewery that has the average volumetric loading rate of three. Um, the plant was designed for a lot more wastewater than they're generating right now. On the maximum, again, this is an average of 17, 18.75. Uh, this particular brewery only brews beer and bottles uh, four and a half days a week. On the other two and a half days a week, there is no wastewater at all going to the wastewater treatment plant. So actually, in midweek, their, vi their volumetric loading rates to the reactor can be as high as 25 kilograms of COD per cubic meter of digester volume per day in their EGSB reactor. Um, the final thing I want to point out on this uh, uh, chart is the bottom line, which is the caustic use. Um, it's, an, it's an expense that everybody has to worry about. Um, typically, we see 0.12 kilograms of sodium hydroxide per kilogram of total COD in is required. And this is exactly the average we saw here in this data. We got 0.11 with a maximum of 0.14 and 0.08. And I want to point out um, that includes typically a combination of what has been dumped by the brewery um, in CIP usage plus what is used at the um, wastewater treatment plant. The, the, uh, that total is usually typically somewhere around 0.12 kilograms of NaOH per kilogram of total COD in. Okay, I want to quickly 
go through some common high rate anaerobic treatment designs that we have used um, through history in the, in the, geez, it's almost 40 year history now of, um, of uh, anaerobic wastewater treatment plant, treatment of brewery wastewater. In fact, the first plant that biothane built in the United States was at the G. Heilman Brewing Company in beautiful downtown La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, in all of our plants, you're going to see in all three of the designs that I'm going to talk about, there's always screening up front. Um, brewery wastewater typically has quite a few solids in the um, influent. These are spent grain, um, bottle caps, keg caps, coffee stirrers, broken glass, pieces of aluminum. I even saw a goldfish come up over a, a, a screen one time at one of the breweries. I have no idea where the goldfish came from, but I did see it, really I did. The wastewater then in the uh, first plants we went, we built, went into a gigantic conditioning tank, which typically had a hydraulic retention time of four to 12 hours. And from the conditioning tank, water was fed to the UASB or EGSB reactor. The F1 either went to the city or back to the conditioning tank as recycle, and the gas was goes to a flare or is compressed and goes to a boiler. The next generation of, of systems still had our screening up front, and we went into an EQ tank, now we're calling it, um, with a hydraulic retention time again of four to 12 hours. From the EQ tank, we went into the reactor. The reactor F1 either went to the city or back to what we call inline recycle back into the EGSB reactor. And in this case, um, the pH control, coarse pH control was done in the EQ tank and fine tuning the pH control was done in the reactor feed line after the recycle was added in. Again, these are UASB and EGSB type reactors. The biogas goes to a uh, safety flare or is used back in the uh, brewery. The current design that we're working with is um, we have a, again, screening up front, a large EQ tank, and we try to do closer to 24 hours, typically 24 hours of holdup. And that's mainly to better buffer out the large swings and flow and load that typically come down from the brewery so that they can be more evenly spread out going to the react, the load can be spread out going to the reactor and get a more even gas production rate, which makes the use of the biogas easier. In this case, we have a new um, conditioning tank design, which is very small. Um, it, the conditioning tank is in two sections, really, um, in, one in one very tall vertical tank. The, the, the conditioning tank's as tall as the reactor is. The bottom section of the reactor receives the influent from the EQ tank and from the bot and is mixed and as goes from the bottom of the conditioning tank into the anaerobic digester. The effluent from the reactor goes into the upper section of the conditioning tank and there's a, a pipe that connects the two uh, sections in the middle there. And water that's needed to make up the reactor feed goes down that pipe. The excess water, the effluent goes out the top of the conditioning tank and goes uh, to the effluent to the municipality. Here, the biogas has been generally, um, we're looking at more people are uh, scrubbing the biogas so that it can be used in um, more types of different uh, combustion equipment. Um, so there's some sort of uh, scrubbing system. And then it usually goes now, we're seeing more and more CHP type units, combined heat and power units being used, where the power is then used to run part of, part of or all of the wastewater treatment plant, and the heat from the units is used to heat the wastewater. Now, how big of and small of systems can we do we make? The smallest reactor that we now make is called our package plant, and it's a reactor that's 12 foot in diameter, 48 foot high, has a volume of approximately 144 cubic meters, which is 38,000 gallons. The minimum influence COD that this 
reactor contributes about 3,600 milligrams per liter, and the minimum volume flow that can be put through there is about 50,000 gallons per day. There is no maximum largest size system. Um, the largest biobed advanced reactor that we make is 62 feet in diameter by 49 feet high with a volume of like 48,000 cubic meters, which is one, almost 1 1.3 million gallons. And we can do multiple tank sizes. We can, a system could have multiple reactors in a system and the size of those tanks can vary anywhere between that smallest size to the largest size. In the maximum flow and loading, we could treat several, several million gallons per day of wastewater and treat several tons of COD per day. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back to TJ now so he can uh, get Michael in line to talk about the uh, Yingling project in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. TJ? Thanks, Jill. Thank you so much for sharing some of that history and, and the progress of technology for uh, anaerobic technologies for brewing and, and the characteristics of brewery wastewater. Um, as many of people on the line have been with us for a couple of years, attending these series on, on improving uh, anaerobic wastewater treatment, we're really glad to welcome you back here for this presentation. We're doing something a little bit different uh, for this year. We're going to try to take a look at, at our current install base and, and see if there are operators willing to, to share a little bit about their experience of operating one of these facilities and the impact that it has uh, on their business and obviously the environmental impact as well. So I'm real excited that we have uh, Michael here with us from Yingling to share a little bit about his project that uh, was installed a few years ago at his brewery in Pennsylvania. So uh, Michael's with us here. Michael, can you hear me? I can hear you good. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, the floor is yours. All righty, guys. Thank you for having me. Uh, as TJ and Jill said, you know, we have uh, currently we have three biothane Veolia plants, uh, two in our Pennsylvania breweries. We have a UASB in Mill Creek, uh, a EGSB in Pottsville, and then another EGSB in our Tampa brewery. So, uh, you know, they, they all the plants work very well. So just a little bit of history about the brewery. We're uh, America's oldest brewery. Uh, we were first founded in, on Market Street in 1829 in Pottsville. Uh, the brewery actually burnt down and was moved to uh, Montantungo Street in 1831. Uh, the reason it was chosen on Montantungo Street is because it's right next to uh, an underground uh, source of water. Like Joe was saying, very low in sulfur. Uh, it, it's very clean water, great for brewing, very soft, no, no, uh, hardly any alkalinity in it. Uh, so once we moved to the new brewery, uh, we brewed there until about 1920 when Prohibition was enacted. During Prohibition, Mr. Yingling did not want to see his employees, you know, go unemployed or anything else. So he decided to make uh, ice cream. They constructed a, a creamery building right across the street from the brewery. 1930, when Prohibition was repealed, they decided to keep the ice cream plant running. The ice cream plant ran until about the 1980s. Uh, it was then sold to the church that was right next door to it. It was used for storage. Uh, it was bought back from the church in the early 2000s. Up until that point, it sat vacant. So uh, the creamery building is pretty unique in its own right. It had seven different levels in it, all old subway tile, pretty neat building. Uh, but it did present some uh, unique challenges for it. So Yingling itself is located in the middle of a city and it's currently landlocked. So as we can see here on the slides, on, on the top left hand side is where the, the back end of the creamery building, that's where the reactors are set now. On the right hand side, we can see the brewery itself, the church, and then the creamery building itself. So up until the early 2000s, the brewery was uh, slowly growing. In 1985, Mr. Yingling introduced a new lager brand, which helped take up, make the brewery take off. So we were presented with challenges of uh, high strength wastewater that was currently overloading the local POTW. So we were challenged with putting uh, a treatment plant in the middle of Pottsville. So our choice was to go with 
Veolia and see what we can come up with. So here are some of uh, the wastewater pretreatment design criteria. We look at, uh, so the brewery itself typically does about 400,000 barrels of beer per year. We do only our light brews there. So like our premiums, our uh, lagers, we don't do any dark brews there. Uh, we used to do kegging operations, but the kegging has been moved to the new brewery. So currently we only do uh, the 12 ounce cans and bottles and 12 ounce bottles. So here's uh, the flow diagram of the, the wastewater pretreatment plant in Pottsville. So all of the wastewater comes down and goes into the screen influent pit. From the screen influent pit is set, the water is set up over a set of dual static screens to remove, like, like Jill was saying, uh, all the spent grain and any other kind of stuff that's inside of the, uh, the wastewater itself. From, this, from the static screens, it is then sent down to the screen influent pit and then it's pumped into the two equalization tanks. So like we were talking before, uh, we're, we were tight with space in Pottsville. So we went with uh, two equalization tanks at a, to make it you know, more feasible for us to put it in there. So the tanks themselves are 28,750 gallons for a combined of 57,500 gallons. So that's about three quarters of the brewery's flow for the day that's able to hold. So once the wastewater is stored in the equalization tanks, it is then uh, flow by gravity to the rapid mix tank. Uh, and the rapid mix tank is where we add our, uh, we do our caustic or pH addition. We also have uh, a port for acid in case we have high strength, uh, high pH coming down. So. At, at the old brewery, Jill was talking about the CIP systems. So we we have CIP systems, but we're not able to reclaim the, the, the cleaning water there. So we can only use it once. So most of it's going down the drain after each cleaning. So from the rapid mix tank, it, the water is then pumped over into the reactors. So we have two different digesters, they're EGSB styles. Uh, so they're used for the reduction of soluble BOD and for the generation of uh, biogas. So before the wastewater, so from the digesters, the water is then passed over to uh, a DAF unit, which is to remove the, sol the total solids. Uh, we put that in to help with our permit compliance. Uh, typically, at some of our other at the two other breweries, we see higher solids in our effluent. But the Pottsville Brewery has not even been close to what we thought it was going to be with solids. Uh, so we haven't paid a surcharge for treating our our solids and our wastewater in close to two years. And we're typically seeing around 200. 200 to 300 milligrams per liter in our, our TSS and our, in our effluent. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here we're looking at, we can see that the two tanks that are closest to the building, they are our EQ tanks. And then the two behind them are the digesters. On the far right hand side, we can see the digesters are a little larger. And then uh, the building with the piping going into it, that holds our static screens. And then at the bottom, we have our two influence and our screen influence subs. Here's an here's what our uh, the static screens look like. So they're basically uh, used to remove any type of grain or any kind of solids that are in the wastewater. Uh, one of the good things and one of the big things that we noticed was underneath of the screens, we have a screw press installed, and the screw press is just used to remove the moisture from the grain. And it's actually reduced our, our about 30%, 30 to 40% of our solids that go to the landfill and by weight. On the right hand side, we could see our rapid mix tank. Uh, 
about a third of the way up through the tank, we could see the chemical addition ports. So we add sodium hydroxide for pH control, acid if need be. And we also add a, a ferric chloride and a, a special blend of micronutrients. So on the left-hand side of the screen, we could see the digester feed pumps. So they run, uh, they're continuously run feeding the digesters to help keep the bed suspended. Uh, in the far back end side of that same picture, we could see our uh, chemical additions for the uh, their ferric chloride drums there. The top right hand side of the screen shows the lab. And it also illustrates a couple of different floors, you know, how we were talking before that there's all the different levels inside of the creamery building. So the bottom floor is where the digester feed pumps are at. Two floors up is where the lab's at. The third floor is where we have our CHP and our boiler. The bottom right hand of the screen is uh, our DAP unit, the dissolved air flotation unit, uh, which we currently are not using because the solids coming from the digesters themselves are is so minimal that it, it, it was more cost effective not to run it than to dispose of the solids. So now here we can see uh, our CHP generator, which is combined heat and power. So we collect the biogas from our from the digester system themselves. We store it. We then send it through a caustic air scrubber, or not a caustic. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> we send it through an iron sponge, and the iron sponge has wood chips and, and iron inside of it that the hydrogen sulfide breaks down the iron instead of damaging the motor itself. On the right hand side, so, oh, sorry. So the CHP itself provides enough power to run our gift shop and museum, as well as the wastewater plant. It also provides uh, the heat for the building itself and the wastewater process. So we do have a small boiler that's uh, installed for supplemental heat if we need it, but the CHP is usually uh, able to take care of everything. On the right hand side of the screen, we have our enclosed flare. So the two other breweries, they just have candlestick flares. This one was a little bit different. Uh, we could not have an open flame in the city of Pottsville. And we also couldn't have any visible emission sources coming from it. So uh, Veolia came up with the enclosed flare and that's what we installed. Now we're gonna look at the wastewater treatment plant performance. So we can see it on the influent. So our plant was installed in 2016 and it's continuously been operating it's until today, currently. So our VFA has been really low, uh, a little bit higher when we started out, but our, our plant operator, Rob, he does VFA testing every day and we see basically zero in our VFA. Uh, our alkalinity is around, I would say, 20 milligrams per liter. I'm ta uh, yeah, I screwed up. That's the influent there. So our, our, we have a low alkalinity coming into the plant itself. Our pH varies, but it's it's higher. It's right around where Jill said around a 10 on the average. And that's from the cleaning processes and also the boilers. We have uh, three old boilers at the, at the brewery and they have blowdowns, which you use caustic also to clean them. So the influent TCOD varies. Uh, we brew about 12 hours a day impossible, and we also can 12 hours a day, so we don't continuously operate there. So the loadings mostly come down from during the daytime. So let's take a look at the effluent. So I was saying before our VFAs, are typically zero continuously, and there's no issues with any of that. The alkalinity ranges around uh, 20 milliequivalents per liter. Uh, our TCOD reduction is outstanding. Uh, you know, typically we're seeing 95% reduction. Uh, so BOD itself, we have a permit limitation 
of uh, one, it's 1,800 pounds per day, and a maximum allowable influent loading of 300 milligrams per liter. So anything above that 300 milligrams per liter, we pay a surcharge on. And from, since 2016, we've only paid about five surcharges for BOD. So we'll take a look at the measurements here. Uh, the digester feed flow is about 1,504. The biogas produced is um, meters cubed per day. Our methane per, uh, percentage falls right into where Jill said, around the 80% range. Our hydrogen sulfide for the generators, the 2,400 uh, parts per million. And our biomass itself, we're seeing, uh, <coughs> excuse me, around 8,000 uh, kilograms of VSS. I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear my dog, he's crying in here in the background. <laughs> So I apologize for that. So we'll look at the calculations. Our TCLD reduction around 90%. The soluble is around 95%. Uh, the FM loadings are around 0.22 of kilograms of TCLD for VSS per day. Volumetric loading is right in average or uh, the design average. It's a little bit lower, but the plant can handle much more than we give it. And then the chemical additions, we use 50% uh, caustic soda, and we're right a little bit lower than the average that Jill was talking about before for the caustic. So here we're looking at the, uh, the possible performance. I'm having a hard time seeing the screen, DJ. So we have uh, the VFA basically at zero continuously since the plant's operation. Uh, and based off the loadings, you can see our, our, everything. The plant runs great. Possible the yearly average of TCOD. So we've actually increased production in Possible. Uh, Possible, we're putting out as much beer as we can there, and as much beer as we've ever done. So the yearly average of TCOD, we see uh, a really good, you know, close to 95% soluble COD reduction. So in summary, the brewery wastewater is similar to many food and beverages. Uh, the treatment plan took in to design the account location. Uh, we are presented with some challenges too as well, <laughs> based on like our effluent, for our final effluent, we needed to put in a, a few uh, backups because we have to pump from a lower street up into uh, Montantungo Street, which is not a combined sewer system. So that was another one of the challenges. So we have a backup generator that powers the plant if there is any uh, power outages or anything like that. And our wastewater treatment plant is treating all of the brewery wastewater. Um, during startup in 2016, I think we, and Jill can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we were treating, within the first six months, we were treating 100% of our brewery wastewater. It, it was actually in, in two weeks. Oh, two weeks. So there you go. Yeah. And we actually we uh seeded most of, most of the seed sludge from came from our brewery in uh, Mill Creek, so it was a pretty quick acclimation period between the two. And then, <clears throat> so the pretreatment itself, uh, what we're what we're aiming for is to reduce high strength wastewater down to municipal levels. And the municipal levels are around that 300 milligrams per liter of BOD, 350 of TSS. And 95% of the time, we're well below that. So we, we couldn't be happier with the plants. They run very well. They're very efficient. And, and they're very cost effective. But the other great part about them is Jill. <laughs> Jill's always there for us. We can get, call her at any time. She gives us, she, she helps me out time. Time and time again, uh, our operator just had a baby, and I remember calling Jill. And I think it was 7:30 in the morning, and I'm, we had a problem with our heat exchanger, and she was able to walk me through it. She hasn't been there in, in a year, and she still knew where everything was at. So, you know, you just don't get 
the only you don't still get the plant you get the people that come with it thank you michael <laughs> oh you're welcome yeah thank you so much mike for that and full disclosure michael was being paid nothing for being a part of this webinar um but we appreciate those those kind words and, and also i'm always impressed of, of uh, jill's uh ironclad memory for for all these plants that she's worked on and commissioned over her years here but um we're wrapping up the traditional part of today's presentation um, as i mentioned before we are doing something new for this year's anaerobic uh, operators continuing education community webinar series uh, and if you are interested uh, in being a part of it if you're operating a biothane plant and you want to share a little bit about you we're looking to highlight different industries different uh, plants that are out there different operators there uh, in, 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 uh, that, that have one of these plants so we could all learn better together and, and share what some of the experiences are out there in, in a real world setting uh, so if that's you and that's something that you want to do just please send me an email. My information is currently on the screen and I'll get in touch with you and we'll see if it's something that we can work together on on a future webinar broadcast. Um, and this leads us right into our interactive portion of today's presentation. Uh, just remind everyone that on the right hand side of the screen, you can enter your question in the chat box and we've got quite a few already and we're gonna look to um, get through as many as possible uh, for both Michael and Jill. Um, and just to kick things off here, question, um, being in the middle of uh, a dense area in Pottsville, did you have to do anything, Michael, for uh, odor control? Because uh, I'm sure that uh, there could be some risk of complaint with having an anaerobic system in a downtown area. So that's a great question. Uh, we actually have houses probably 15 feet away from uh, where our odor control system is and probably 30 feet away from where the digesters and everything else is generated at. So uh, we do have a robust uh, air cleaning system in there. We have a caustic air scrubber that treats all the vent gas from each one of the processes. And then we also have a carbon uh, tank for finishing, uh, for, for final polishing of the air before it's uh, sent out to the atmosphere. So people are right next door to us. There's constantly people at the brewery and there's people that are walking by day and night we have haven't had any odor complaints or any visible any noticeable odors coming from the plant okay um just an additional question here um let me scroll down to it so this has the question with commissioning is it did you have to seed the plant with biomass in uh in order to get it up and running in two weeks can you talk a little bit about that jill yeah, as, as Michael pointed out, they had an already operating plant at Mill Creek, which is like over the hill from Pottsville. Um, so they saved biomass from their UASB reactor in Mill Creek and brought it up to seed the reactors in downtown Pottsville. Uh, they didn't have quite enough to seed everything. I think we got some from Smuckers um, to, to top it off. And then we started with that. So yeah, and that's that's standard for all of our startups. They're always seeded with biomass from another high rate system. Okay. Uh, a question for Michael, it's not so much about the anaerobic um, portion, but uh, a question is, does your facility separate out the waste yeast or does that go to your treatment plant? Oh, that's another great question. Uh, so we separate the, the waste yeast, uh, all the solids that come down. We do have a little bit of wash water that comes down from the yeast but we, we try and remove all of it and one of the things we do with the yeast is it's it's recycled and resold so we we get it, it more value of it to take it out of the process and sell it than sending it to the plant okay thank you so much um an additional question here uh, what is the typical design overflow rate for the high rate reactor um jill can you can you comment on that I'm not sure what they're asking. Um, the upflow velocities in the high rate systems can vary from, in our new reactors, can vary from uh, two meters per hour up to 10 meters per hour up for upflow velocity in the reactor. Is that what they're asking? Or it, it, I'm not sure. So if, if um, for the person who asked that question, if you if you uh, want to comment again, feel free. So we'll try to get back to it. Yeah, well, um, then the 
on the settlers, it's a little less because the settler takes it's a little more actually because the settler takes up less area than the, than the reactor. But typically, we want to have um, you know two to uh, to ten again on the on the uh, of the settlers. Uh, a question about temperature is, um, let me see if I can find that question. Um, uh, which method to maintain temperature in the USAB to keep the bacteria happy uh, are present inside the system of a USB? So what is what is the common methods that clients maintain the temperature uh, of, other, of, of the influent? So typically, we just use hot water. We use a heat exchanger with a closed loop hot water from a boiler, or like in Michael's case, we're using uh, hot water from the um, CHP. But it's a closed loop system um, with just heat exchangers. Uh, usually, follow- typically plate and frame heat exchangers. And a follow up to that, your influent temperature, Michael, was, was 70 something F. Uh, was that before it entered the heat exchanger coming from the CHP? No, I believe that was coming down from the brewery itself. Am I right, okay. Joe? I, yeah. th- I think that's what they're saying, yep. Yeah, so uh, it's, the 73 is what's coming from the brewery. That influence is from the brewery. Okay, and a uh, question would be is with the TKN, where's that coming from commonly from brewery wastewater, Jill? Uh, Wart and Trube, and May- Michael, you can say more probably. Yeah, we see we see it from uh, the fermenters as well, some of the yeast, the wash water that comes down. Uh, and then most of the nitrogen, uh, they call it free amino nitrogens, it comes from the brewing process itself and the breakdown of the grains and the malts during the brewing process. And it comes down, down as, uh, like Joe was saying, as the wort that comes down from the brewery. It's the, it's the proteins from the in the wart in the true. Yep. And a question about proteins and H2S. Uh, are protein thiols a meaningful contributor to the biogas? H2S? Um, not as much as the source of what comes in in the source water. Okay. Uh, the question about the conditioning tank, and that was a, the third schematic that you shared, Jill. Can you talk a little bit about how that conditioning tank works again? The the new conditioning tank is a tall tank that's the height of the reactor. The F1 from, it's in two sections, and think the top half is about two-thirds of the volume, and the bottom half is a third of the volume, and there's a plate in the middle of the, um, uh, at that intersection with a pipe that goes down. The wastewater from the reactor goes into the top section and what doesn't go through that pipe to the bottom uh, goes overflows and goes out the top of the conditioning tank. It's it's really neat Um, and the only water that comes down is what's required to make up the difference between the influent and the reactor feed flow. So it's the recycle. Okay, here's sort of a, a question, hypothetical question for you, Michael, is um, do you ever consider co-mixing the brewery waste stream with a municipal POTW with CHP, PPPI? I'm not sure exactly what that is, but uh, this should reduce, it, uh, the asker saying it should reduce the requirement for uh, NACL alkalinity buffering to get benefits in the power generation. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand that, DJ. Uh... Well, yeah, and, and back to the asker. Yeah, back to the asker. We'll we'll follow up with with you on this one as as well. Um, we'll we'll take a look and get back in touch with you. Um, okay, and then a question about pH. What pH do you need in the reactor? Why do you need to add um, NaOH if the raw pH uh, is more than nine? Ah, uh, that's a really really good question. Um, You need to add caustic because remember that the anaerobic digestion process is a two-step process. And the first step is converting the carbohydrates into fatty acids. So all of that COD has to make an acid before it can be made into methane. And in the process of making those acids, the pH drops even 
with the pH coming in at 10. That 10 has no alkalinity, okay? So it doesn't take much to change the pH once the acidification starts. And we wanna keep the pH in the reactor. My rule of thumb is I don't like the reactor effluent pH to be less than 6.8, especially in these tall reactors, because that means okay. the bottom pH is less than that. And the activity, the biomass drops as the pH drops. So we want to keep the biomass as active as possible. Um, okay, uh, looking at some of the questions here, making sure I get as, as many done as possible. Um, you touched on this before, Michael, but what is the equipment used to remove solids after the digester? So what's in there is a, a dissolved air flotation unit, a DAF unit. And what that is, uh, all the wastewater comes through the unit and there's uh, bubblers on the bottom of it and it produces a fine a fine bubble. And they, they add, uh, we add a polymer to it and the polymer helps coagulate everything, pull everything together. And then it, it just collects all the solids at the top of it and then pushes them over into a tank itself. So when we were running, the uh, the DAF unit itself, we were seeing probably 10 to 20 parts per million of TSS in our eff effluent, which is which is outstanding. But we're paying for, you know, we're allowed to discharge up to 300 milligrams per liter. And it had a, the disposal cost for the DAF solids was a little bit more expensive to to get rid of. So as a company, uh, financially, we decided that we weren't going to use it. But it's still in line. If we need to use it, we can. Uh, so, and Jill, outside of just Yingling, what are you seeing um, after treatment after the after the reactors to take care of solids at other breweries? Well, nothing really except for a DAF if they need it. I'm trying to think. I don't. I don't think any of the other breweries have have a have it have it because they. They, uh, it's cheaper because when you when you have to remove the solids, you have to pay for the disposal, and usually it's cheaper to let the solids go down the drain than to dispose of, take them out and dispose of them. Okay, um, we got through most of the questions there. Let me see, just make a one more. Um, oh, do you do you see any soluble methane in the effluent? Technically, there is, yes. Okay. There has to be, but it's very, very little. Not too much to worry about, okay. Um, I mean, there is the, there. you will get um, LEL in the effluent, but most of that LEL is due to hydrogen sulfide rather than methane that would be um, escaped from the uh, uh, water. Methane's not very soluble in water. TJ, if you don't mind, I have a question for Jill based on that one. <laughs> are there a lot of people that are testing that in their effluent? No. Okay, because I was going to say that's something we never looked at. No, nobody does. Back to biogas. What percentage of biogas is able to be claimed or reclaimed, I'm guessing, for use uh, running the wastewater treatment plant in gift shop versus being flared off? Typically, we don't use the flare at all. Um, so one of the things that we did was, it's a small, like this plant's a little smaller. It's a 200 kW generator for the CHP. So uh, we add, we added a natural gas blending system to where we can blend natural gas in with the biogas, and we have a continuous uh, continuous supply of natural gas with the with the methane. So our generator runs pretty much you know 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the only time the flare's really on is if we're uh, working on the generator, it's down for an extended period of time. So, you know, the flare is usually not, doesn't run at all. Okay, and going back to another question, any idea of the fraction of unbiodegradable COD in the effluent? And I guess this is more speaking in general, brewery wastewater. Um, as long as you have no VFA in the effluent, you've really eaten everything that can be eaten, or the digester has. So, it, and it varies from brewery to brewery. Um, 
and I don't know why it varies different brewery processes or something, but you know, it, you know, 95% of your COD is reduced. You're eating just about everything that's there. I don't have a percentage number for you. I'm sorry. Uh, some general questions, Jill, about uh, wastewater treatment for food and beverage applications, but can you talk about FOG limitations for high rate anaerobic reactors? Oh yeah, that's a good one. An FOG is something that we don't see in breweries. Um, but yes, there are limits to fats, oils, and greases um, allowed in high rate systems. On the EGSB reactors, we like to see, I'm gonna say less than 75, less than 50 parts per million of FOG. We can take a little bit higher in the UASB systems, maybe 75 to 100 parts per million FOG. And we don't want more than that because the FOG can coat the granules, which will float them out. And if you float out all your sludge, there's nothing in the reactor to do the work. But also when the FOG coats the granule, um, it doesn't allow the soluble COD to get in there to be treated. So there's several bad things about FOGs and high rate systems. It doesn't mean that the FOG is not treatable, it's just not treatable in a high rate system. And you mentioned that there's limited uh polishing treatment at breweries after after the reactors uh, but is it common to have any kind of aerobic treatment after the anaerobic system for other kind of facilities within f and b yeah um um there's several plants that we have that um actually go direct stream discharge one of them is a brewery so they have a full um aerobic um, activated sludge system afterwards with clarifiers and um the whole nine yards that go along with aerobic treatment before it goes direct stream discharge into a local river and several plants uh you know of our other plants also do that typically though it's less expensive to go to the city than to operate the um a a full-scale um aerobic system after it but it is possible it's 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 you know not uncommon uh the question would be, another question would be, does the feed flow control scheme need to be uh, updated, have update, up-to-date COD numbers to maintain an even load? And then uh, the follow-up question would be, is what kind of load fluctuation is tolerated for uh, high rate anaerobic reactors? Um, typically, we don't measure the load, um, instantaneously i mean you can do it with a toc meter um and try to do it that way the bigger your buffer capacity is in in that eq tank the better it is i would say that over a day you can take uh minus the load doesn't matter um plus the load 50 percent of the average design load plus over a day is certainly tolerable um mm. you know you're you're not going to see swings that go from uh you know a loading of a uh, volumetric loading of one to ten in ten minutes so that just doesn't happen because you have the recycle and and the equalization and the conditioning tanks up front so um you just don't see those those wide swings but you will see swings throughout the day but it's more like over several hours than than instantaneous type type loading variations do you mind if i add on to that too jill uh, sure so a lot of them controls come from the brewery itself uh, before we had treatment impossible it was kind of like the wild west you could send whatever you wanted down a drain and nobody worried about it so now we you know we limit the amount of tanks that they can clean per per day and per hour you know what i mean we don't want them cleaning 10 aging tanks at one time or you know while they're brewing and bottling and everything else so we do a lot of controls in the brewery the other thing like joe was saying about the keg beer that comes back uh, we try and feed the digesters continuously so if we're not operating on a saturday and sunday like now with, with this coronavirus stuff and everything else we have return beer and kegs stuff like that so we're we're storing that stuff and we're sending it down the drain on the weekends or when the loadings are, are really low for the plant and it, it's benefits so we're getting rid of the beer and then we're also producing biogas which helps us with our electricity then too so and just a follow-up question to that too, uh, Michael and Jill, but um, with varying production schedules where a brewery might be uh, not operating as much or might have to go dormant for a period of time, can you talk about how that affects 
the biomass within the reactor? The biomass can go dormant. I mean, it doesn't have to be fed. It can be dormant for a year, and then you can start up again. Um, that's not an issue with anaerobic digesters. Of course, if you have your aerobic afterwards, that's another story. But um, because they have to be aerated and fed all the time. But on anaerobic, the biomass, the that's one of the great things about anaerobic is they don't have to be fed. Um, if you stop feeding them and let them cool down, they're good for a year, if not longer. Okay. And just one final question here is: What are the typical anaerobic sludge densities in UASB and EGSBs, Joe? Anywhere from five to twelve percent solids. Okay. So well, that's 50, so that's fifty thousand milligrams per liter to one hundred and twenty thousand milligrams per liter TSS in the sludge bed. Well, sorry for those at um, at three o'clock. We uh, we went ran a couple minutes late. Uh, then, then we try to end. I just want to remind everyone to take that short survey to be entered into our drawing for an Amazon gift card right after today's presentation. Uh, I would like to really thank first and foremost Jill uh, Jordan for her time to share this, but uh, more importantly thanking uh, Mike from Yingling as well. He spent a lot of time in, in, in developing this presentation and, and practicing with us and really meant a lot for us to, to co-present um, co with him and have him on here today to ensure that uh, he shares his knowledge with the rest of the community that we're working on always trying to build. So thank you, Mike. Um, lastly, I want to thank everyone who spent their hour with us here today on Earth Day. It meant a lot to, uh, to share, share with you these, these, uh, these experts' um, experience. Uh, and be on the lookout for future webinars, and you can keep uh, in touch with us at our website, viewlyawatertech.com. So I want to wish everyone a great day and a great week. Take care.